My name is A. Fennewarp. I'm a researcher and educator in the field of specialty contact lenses. I'm affiliated with a number of universities in North America with Pacific University in Oregon and the University of Montreal in Canada. And I want to walk you through the essence of scleral lenses. And we want to do that in a series of five educational videos of about 15 minutes each. And this is based on a literature search, but also and especially the clinical input of educators and clinicians from around the world, from Australia to Europe, South America to the US. And what the videos include is who needs scleral lenses, how to fit them in a five-step fitting approach, management scleral lenses, care and maintenance, and then some advanced topping including toric scleral lenses, for instance. As an educator, I want these educational videos to be unbiased to watch any fitting technique, industry partner, or location. I do want eye care practitioners to be aware of what scleral lenses can do, potentially, for the patients that need them. Brought to you by XL Specialty Contacts. My name is Eve van der Borp. I'm from the Netherlands. And I want to talk you through the pretty amazing story of scleral lenses. I'm an educator primarily and a researcher. And what I will tell you today in these educational videos is based on what I think all the literature out there on the topic. And more importantly, probably based on clinical input from scleral lens fitters from around the world who work with this device, these devices on a daily basis from Australia to Europe, South America and the US. The general interest in scleral lenses have been increasing quite dramatically over the last couple of years. I've been involved with this for 10 years. And if you look at, for instance, a website like this, All About Vision, um, you'll see that the search engine on sclerals um, has gone up quite dramatically from very little uh, five to 10 years ago to almost like four or 5,000 searches on scleral lenses a month uh, just recently. We did a, um, a literature review uh, uh, pretty recently on scleral lenses, and we looked at all the publications in the peer-reviewed journals. And interestingly enough, you see a peak around the late 60s, early 70s, then kind of a drop. It was kind of slow for scleral lenses for a long time. And now recently, that it's almost impossible to follow everything that is coming out on scleral lenses. So again, I want to walk you through all of that. And the first video is about who needs sclerals. In the early days, scleral lenses were for the really irregular cornea. So basically, if somebody could not wear a corneal GP lens, you would have to go to a scleral lens. So that means corneal grafts, pellucid marginal degenerations, images like you see here in these uh, pictures on this slide. Now, that has brought it up quite a bit. So let me go through the three groups that I think exist on the indications for scleral lenses. One, the, the number one has always been and still is the irregular cornea. If there's any irregularity on the cornea, like you'll see in these images here, or literally there's a bump, you can bridge over that with a scleral lens. The beauty of a scleral lens is it doesn't touch the cornea. It lands on the conjunctiva and on the sclera, which is very insensitive, so that also gives it the comfort. So basically every irregularity that you'll see on the cornea with your corneal topographer, you can bridge over that with a scleral lens. So that is group number one. And within that group of the irregular cornea, the primary ectasia, such as keratoconus, pellucid marginal degeneration, these are still the number one indication for scleral lenses. No matter how much ectasia there is, you can bridge over that if you want. Within that group of primary ectasia, there's also this group that had treatment for that primary ectasia. And that treatment is quite diverse these days. It could be intrastromal rings, as we've just seen. It could be a surgery, or it could be something like corneal crosslinking. But all these corneas still may need a scleral lens at some point. And then there are the uh, secondary ectasia. This is typically the post-refractive surgery. If lenses are needed, typically standard lenses cannot work or would not work, and then scleral lenses come in 
to correct vision for these patients. And there's a series of case reports uh, that we published in a case report series that is actually available from the Pacific University website that you can download. So we're talking about post-LASIK, post-RK, those kind of corneas could really benefit from scleral lenses. Then there's a second group, which is kind of diverse, and it ranges from high refractive error, so for instance, high myopia, if we're talking minus 10 or more maybe, um, and you cannot fit that with a standard soft or rigid lens, uh, scleral lenses may come in there. Sports, more recently we see more scleral lenses for outdoor sports, maybe canoeing, biking, dusty environments like horse riding and all that. Allergies, um, some people prefer scleral lenses because it blocks sort of all of the pollen in the air, um, not to, cannot enter the ocular surface. And to some degree, cosmetics. If you have a, um, a condition like we see in this uh, particular slide, um, well, there's actually two reasons here why you could use a scleral. One is that scar that you see, and typically with scleral lenses, the visual acuity in eyes with a scar um, clear up really nice. So the visual acuity is really good typically uh, in conditions like this. But with an iris like this, in this uh, extended pupil if you want, um, there's too much distortion and the patient still wouldn't see. So one is you wanted to clear that up for a cosmetic reason. Secondly, you could have a clear pupil scleral lens. Typically these lenses are hand painted and you could cover up the, uh, the rest of the area. That second group is sort of expanding uh, growing, but this third group certainly is, and that's the group of the dry eyes. If there's any dry eye, any ocular surface disease, and I'm not going to name all the conditions, but that comes from pretty severe to um, a marginal dry eye, not the really marginal dry eye, but just a little bit of discomfort, but if you have a dry eye, the beauty of a scleral lens is that it creates this nice layer of fluid between the lens and the cornea, and that moists the cornea. Some of the practices that do a lot with scleral lenses, so they're primarily there to fit scleral lenses, the majority of the lens fits they would do is probably with this group, within this group of dry eye, corneal exposure, even epithelial healing. I have to say, it can be a different ball game because patient management in, this, uh, in these cases is quite different from the first and the second group, um, but these patients can benefit tremendously from scleral lenses. So why would you want to fit a scleral lens? Well, we have corneal GP lenses, and corneal GP lenses, as everybody knows, have a long track record. They're safe, they provide good vision. Well, there are a couple of downsides to it. And one is that you need fitters that can actually fit these corneal GP lenses. If the cornea gets irregular, it's kind of a challenge to fit these. You probably need a corneal topographer as well. The second thing is a condition that's called three and nine o'clock staining. And I did quite a little bit of research in that area. And we think we can help to prevent three and nine o'clock staining, but we don't have a real solution to it, to be honest other than bridging over that cornea with a scleral lens. So that is one of the solutions. If you have a consistent uh, three nine o'clock staining patient, for instance, a carotid conus with that, one of the things you could do is go to a scleral lens. And there's no mechanical pressure whatsoever of the lens in scleral lens wear, where you have mechanical pressure with a corneal lens. So corneal warpage is a little bit more of an issue. And for instance, we know from the CLEC study here in the US that if you fit a um, corneal GP lens, you want it to stay away from the top of that cone because the more mechanical pressure there is, the more scarring there may be. So there are a couple of benefits. So scleral lenses bypass the most sensitive part of the eye. So landing on that sclera and on that conjunctiva. The lens fit is independent from corneal shape, so no matter how irregular that cornea gets, you will be able to get over that. If there is any progression of a disease, like for instance in carotid conus, there is room to some degree to do that without changing the lens. 
And there's no lens movement, so that really adds to the comfort. And there's much less interaction of the eyelids with the edges of the lens. So what about corneal surgery? When we, when we think about that first group of the primary ectasia, a corneal surgery, a corneal transplant is certainly an option. There's the full corneal transplant or there's the partial corneal transplant. Especially the first one has a disadvantage that you need stitches and after the procedure, the, the cornea typically still is irregular to some degree. And for some patients that means you still need a lens, oftentimes a scleral lens. So that can be a big disappointment for some patients that after the surgery and everything that's been true, they still need the scleral lens. To a more limited degree, that's still true for the uh, partial corneal transplant. Um, that is kind of surgery dependent. But in both groups, there still may be some corneal irregularity. So it's not a true solution for many of these primary ectasia. What about corneal cross-linking? Corneal cross-linking is becoming more and more popular to sort of stabilize the cornea, but it doesn't solve the actual ectasia. So it tries to stop the progression, but still a lens is needed at some point to get that visual acuity. And oftentimes that is actually a scleral lens. So surgery is not a solution. And one other thing is that when the corneal, with regards to the corneal transplants, the shelf life, if you want, of a corneal graft is not that long. It's maybe 20 years, maybe 30 years, but after that, some of these patients would need a second procedure as well. The bottom line is, if you can keep patients in a lens, and oftentimes that means a scleral lens now these days, then you're probably better off than sending them in for surgery. So as long as you can postpone that surgery, um, you probably want to do that with your lens options that we have today. Let's take a quick look at the terminology of scleral lenses, and that comes back to indication as well. The sclerolens.org website um, has come up with a terminology uh, scheme, and what it comes down to is if the lens lends on the cornea, it's a corneal lens, if it partially rests on the cornea and partially on the sclera, it's a corneal scleral lens. And then if it fully rests on the sclera, it's a scleral lens. Now that may seem simple, and it is, but some lenses out there, 14, 6 millimeter in diameter, for instance, they partially land on the cornea and partially on the sclera. So that would be a corneal scleral lens. Another 14.6 could land entirely on the sclera or solely on the sclera, and it would be, therefore, by definition, a scleral lens. So even lenses with the same diameter could have different definitions. So we really want to go by the landing zone, where the lens actually lands. That is what we'll call them. And then within the lenses that solely rest or land on the sclera, there's sort of an artificial or an arbitrary distinction between large diameter and small diameter. Um, typically, if you look at the horizontal uh, visual iris diameter and you add six millimeter, that is sort of the arbitrary cutoff point for a mini scleral or a uh, large scleral lens. And we'll talk in the other videos that we'll be uh, presenting to you about why you want to fit one lens over the other, but typically, it, if you want to have more vault, if you want to bridge that cornea more, for instance, if there's more ectasia, you typically want to go bigger. But again, we'll come back to that in actually our next video. So let me try to summarize this. In conclusion, the indication range for scleral lenses seem to be broadening up almost on a daily basis from the very irregular cornea where no other lens would fit to a much broader range of uh, indications. There are a couple of benefits that scleral lenses have over corneal lenses, and that's why we see so many scleral lens fits these days. Corneal surgery is still an option, certainly will be, and cross-linking definitely is one of them to stop the progression of the disease, but oftentimes still a scleral lens is needed to get, correct the vision and to get that patient the visual acuity that he or she needs. I think the most important take-home message of this first 
educational video of the five that we'll be presenting is that a scleral lens bridges over the entire cornea. So no matter how irregular that is, you don't have to worry about that and you don't have to deal with it. And it lands on a very insensitive part of the eye, which is the conjunctiva and the sclera. So this was the first educational video on who needs sclerals or who could benefit from scleral lenses. And I think it's very important to show eye care practitioners that what scleral lenses can do and hopefully how many patients can benefit from it. If you want to learn more, there's a couple of more edu educational videos on a f actually how to fit scleral lenses in a five-step fitting approach, what to do when managing scleral lens wear, how to manage it, patient care and maintenance, and then in some cases where you have to go the extra mile for the more challenging cases. So thank you very much for watching. Brought to you by XL Specialty Contacts. My name is A. Vanderwerp. I'm from the Netherlands and I'm primarily an educator and a researcher. And I want to talk you through the essence of scleral lens fitting. And we already talked in video number one about who needs sclerals. Now I want to talk about how to fit scleral lenses. Basically, there's two ways of doing it. In the early days, there was the impression technique, where they used to take a mold of the eye and made a cast out of that to make a typically a PMMA lens. There's more modern ways of doing that too, but the bulk of scleral lens fitting, and actually the reason why scleral lens fitting has gotten so popular, is that we have a trial set, a set that where you can actually pick your first lens and see how it goes. So we'll be talking about preformed or trial set fitting scleral lenses here. In essence, there's five steps that you have to follow to fit a scleral lens. And I, I want to walk you through each and every one of them. And it all starts with the diameter. In the first video, we already looked at the different diameters and the terminology. But let, let's take a look at how much space there actually is. What is our workbench? If you look at the anatomy of the eye, we know the cornea is about 12 millimeters then we know that that's on the nasal and temporal side and superior and inferior, about another 12 millimeters. So overall, we're looking at a workbench of maybe 24 millimeters. You don't want your scleral lens to be bigger. If they're bigger, it starts to interfere with the insertion of the eye muscles. If the, lens, if the eye starts to move, the lens will come off of the ocular surface. You create some space and potentially some air bubbles. So that's not going to work. So typically, or basically, all scleral lenses are smaller than that. Typically, they're much smaller uh, in the 16 millimeter range on average, maybe, but you definitely want to, don't want to go bigger than that. We talked about the terminology a little bit and the different types of lending of the different lenses. And one thing that is important to understand is if you want to create more liftoff, you want to create more fold, more clearance, more space between the lens and the cornea, typically you want to go a little bit bigger. Otherwise, there's too much pressure on a small area on the conjunctiva, and the lens may sink into that conjunctiva a little bit more. So it's almost like a stiletto heel with a very narrow, a lot of mechanical pressure on a very small area versus a snowshoe where you can sort of um, have an area of lending on that sclera. The choice of diameter is partly based on that, based on indication and how much fold you want to create, and it's partly based on where you're from. There are cultural differences. In Europe, we tend to fit a little bit larger scleral lenses, and it's also based on personal preference. It's not necessarily so that one is better than the other. But the clearance, the, if you want to reduce the clearance, you typically want to go smaller with your scleral lenses. So let's talk about that clearance. What is it and how can you adjust for that? As we said in the first video, clearance of a scleral lens is the number one benefit. So we, need to, we want to make sure that we use that to our full potential. We want to make sure at all times that the scleral lens bridges over the ocular surface. By how much? Well, that's up for discussion. Let's take a look at that. The best way of analyzing clearance is either by looking at the cornea. We know the cornea is typically 
500, 540 microns thick. Problem is, in for instance keratoconus, that can be reduced quite dramatically, like 350 or something. So you don't know exactly what the thickness of the cornea is in all conditions. Probably a better way of looking at it is look at the thickness of the lens. Your company that you work with can tell you the exact thickness of the scleral lens, of the trial lens that you're using, and you can take that as a reference. Now that small little space between the cornea and the lens is your clearance. And you can look at that either by using fluorescein or without. The good thing about fluorescein is that you get a better mark on the, on the back surface of the lens and the front surface of the lens to use that as a reference. Some people like the white light better. And if patients come in for checkups, typically they don't have fluorescein in their eye. So it's good to use both techniques, typically. Here's another example where you can see, hopefully, the front surface of the lens going from left to right, the back surface of the lens, that green area, that's the clearance, and then the cornea. So if we assume that this lens is about 250 microns thick, that clearance is probably about double of that. You also see that it's about the thickness of the cornea. So we're probably looking at a clearance here that is quite severe, about 500 microns of clearance, just as an example. There's a beautiful scleral lens fit scale, which is developed by the people at the Ferris State University, that can be a great help to analyze the clearance. It gives you different clearances and different examples from 50 microns all the way up to 600 microns, which can be downloaded from the Ferris State University website. Some companies use lenses that indicate the different zones. So when we talk about clearance, the clearance we have just been talking about, we talk about the central clearance. But we want clearance from center all the way into the periphery, into the limbal zone. So you can look at clearance like the way we just did, or you can get an overall overview with fluorescein, and you don't want to see any dark areas, or as little as possible, where the clearance is minimal or limited to maybe 20 microns. If it's darker, it's probably less than that. So that comes close to actually touching the cornea, and again, you don't want that. Let's take a look at the limbal clearance now. In the middle picture, below, you'll see air bubbles in that limbal zone. So that probably means the lens is lifted off of the cornea too much and you get that air bubbles. On the other slide, on the right, you'll see the green in the middle, but then that dark band pretty much all around, almost 360. So there's too much landing of that scleral lens in the limbal zone. So the clearance in that limbus is too little. So while you want probably on average, depending on the lens type and the manufacturer, but please talk to your consultant with the lab that you're working with. But somewhere on the, in the range of 200 to 400 microns is where you want to be in the central cornea. Then in the limbal zone, you probably want to reduce it to somewhere around 100. That is sort of the average that I see in here from different eye care practitioners around the world. And then on the landing zone or scleral zone, you want a uniform landing, but we'll be talking about that in just a little bit. From a more scientific standpoint, and we'll talk about more about this topic in the next video, there's something with the delivery of oxygen through the scleral lens and through the clearance. And that comes down to the, uh, the amount of clearance that is necessary or needed to provide the cornea with enough oxygen. And I'll give you the summary right now, and again, we'll talk more about that in the next video. But typically, if you have a high decay material in the center thickness of 250, your clearance should not be much more than 200 to provide the cornea with the oxygen that we think is necessary. Again, more on that in the next video. One thing you wanna take into account that if you fit a scleral lens, it can sort of settle or sink into the conjunctiva over the course of the day. Typically in the first hour, you'll see most of that sinking or uh, settling, um, but typically you wanna see, especially if it's a first lens fit, after eight hours, again, 
uh, or at one of the checkups to see if you still have that amount of clearance that you want. So basically you want to overshoot. You want to make sure you have a little bit of reserve to allow the lens to settle over the course of the day. Remember, the one benefit of scleral lenses is clearance. So make sure you have enough of that, but not too much. All right, so what are the next steps? Well, let's take a look at number three and number four, bearing and the edge of the lens. We can summarize those, take them together and say, this is the landing zone of the scleral lens. Literally, it's where the lens lands on that scleral or conjunctiva. And you want it to be a smooth landing. I mean, almost literally like a plane, you don't want it to be bumpy. You want that alignment and a smooth ride coming down off that scleral lens from the corneal area with the clearance into the landing where the lens actually fits. Numerous studies at uh, Pacific universities looked at that area, the limbus and the anterior sclera. And one of the first thing we found is that the sclera especially isn't curved. It's almost like a straight line. And even the transition from cornea to sclera, which you would expect to be a, quite a transition, almost like a nick, it's not there. It's a gradual transition typically. So what we started to do is measure angles, limbal angles, scleral angles, instead of curvatures in that particular area. And here you see a beautiful OCT image of the landing of that scleral lens onto the um, conjunctiva and sclera. And here's another beautiful picture where you see the scleral lens and that landing zone and that straight transition out into the periphery. I want to refer again to the Ferris State uh, scale, where they also have a scale looking at the different kind of landing. And there's basically two things that can happen. The landing zone is too much or too flat, so you get a lift off at the edge of the lens, or it's too steep or it's too tight. And then you'll get an area where you get blanching of the blood vessels. So basically, you'll get a whitening effect on the conjunctiva. So here's an example of that, where that is happening out in the periphery near the lens edge. Now there's two things that can happen, and this is quite important. And um, Lynette Johns described that in the scleral lens fitting guide that we wrote, and she explained it like this. There's compression and there's impingement. For compression, blanching of the conjunctival vessels as a result of the excessive bearing of the scleral lens in the peripheral curve. So compression typically will not result in any kind of staining if you remove the lens. There may be some rebound hyperemia, but nothing else. For impingement, the edge of the lens focally really is pinching on the conjunctival tissue. So impingement will or can result in conjunctival staining of the lens removal and long term even can result in uh, conjunctival hypertrophy. For instance, in this image here, you'll see some of the blanching and some of that impingement probably at the same time. This is an image where you'll see almost no blanching, basically, but there is that impingement because you see that blood vessel coming in and it's sort of blocked, at least partially. Um, it's not always a problem, but uh, typically this is what we were uh, talking about and what we're looking for and what we try to avoid if we can. So with that, we've have actually covered the four most important steps for now, one to four. The next step would be to look at if the sclera is not regular, if it's not symmetrical. Then we would have to go to a non-rotational symmetrical lens. In normal language, that means it's a toric scleral lens. And there are very good ways of doing it, and there's actually some benefits off of that. Um, but we won't get into that until movie number five when we talk about going the extra mile. For now, these are the most important steps in fitting a scleral lens, and I want to thank you for watching. Brought to you by XL Specialty Contacts. My name is Eve van der Worp, I'm from the Netherlands, and uh, I want to talk you through the essence of uh, scleral lens fitting, scleral lens wear. And in this uh, third educational uh, movie, we want to look at 
management of scleral lenses. And there's a couple of issues we want to talk about with regards to corneal health and fitting tips. First thing is oxygen delivery, and we touched on that in the second movie just a little bit. Let's take a closer look at that. So when you look at the oxygen delivery through a lens to the eye, there's a couple of things we need to look at. First, the decay of the material, the amount of oxygen that goes through the material, or oxygen permeability. But the most important thing is the thickness. So you have to relate that to the thickness of a lens. And scleral lenses typically are thicker, so you, you will see a reduction in the amount of oxygen that gets through the material. And that's where the decay over T comes in. In addition to that, in scleral lens wear, you see the clearance zone also create some kind of filter, at least in theory. And we think the decay of that area is about 80. So depending on the thickness of that, you'll have another reduction in the amount of oxygen that gets to the cornea. So how much oxygen do you need for the cornea to function normally in a daily open eye situation? In this graph here on the slide, on the y-axis, we see the decay of the lens material from 100 to 300, which is a theoretical value. Our lenses that we have, the materials that we have, don't go any higher than 150 or 170. On the horizontal line, we see the clearance, the amount of space that we can create, basically, between the lens and the cornea. And then the variable in the white and in the gray is the thickness of the lens. So if you have a certain decay with a certain clearance, what can your lens thickness be? What we see in this slide is everything that is sort of dark gray has a negative lens thickness. So that is a theory. You can't have a negative lens thickness. It doesn't exist. The light gray is a positive lens thickness, but it's very thin. Those lenses would be too thin to manually clean. You warp the lens and you break the lens. And then in the white, those are the lens thickness that we actually could use in practice. And what we'll see, for instance, let's assume we have a material that's 150, and let's assume we have a clearance of 200, then your lens should not be much thicker than 250. So those are the general guidelines, if you want, for the thickness of a lens when it comes to scleral lens wear. Studies that I just showed you were from the University of Montreal and were later um, confirmed by the uh, people at the University of Minho in, uh, in Portugal. That is theory. In all honesty, if you look at eyes with scleral lenses, even if the lenses are a little bit thicker and even if there is a little bit more clearance, these eyes look extremely healthy most of the time. So as you can see in these pictures, they look white, they look healthy. So maybe we're missing something in clinical practice as opposed to the theory, we're not quite sure. One thing is for sure that maybe we are not able to pick up very subtle amounts of hypoxia or edema. If there's a little bit of um, edema, if there's a little bit of swelling, up to 4%, we wouldn't be able to pick that up. Only if it gets to grade two, three, four, that is when we see the clinical sign as we see in this uh, natonephron animation. The typical amount of swelling that you get overnight if you're not wearing a lens is about two, three, or maybe 4%. So scleral lenses stay within that, but obviously you want to avoid any of that hypoxia during the course of the day. So that is still research going on. In general, yes, you want to reduce your amount of clearance, but remember rule number one from the previous videos, we want to stay clear of the cornea. So be careful with trying to minimize that clearance too much. Especially if it comes to eyes like this, where you have a corneal graft, you certainly do not want the lens to touch the edge of that graft because that could cause serious problems. 
in general, I have to be honest, these are the most challenging eyes. Because especially if it's a full corneal transplant, that endothelium is typically damaged, or at least the quality of the endothelium is less, so the oxygen uptake on the endothelial side is a little bit less. So typically, these are the eyes that where you actually could see uh, the swelling and the uh, hypoxia taking place. Some people have instruments to measure the cell density of the endothelium, and they say if it's less than 1,000 or 800, uh, sh you should not fit a scleral lens and try some other device. So to conclude on this part of the uh, presentation, corneographs in general are probably our most challenging eyes when it comes to this uh, hypoxia debate. Another thing that's way less invasive, but pretty annoying at times, is bubbles. Air bubbles underneath the scleral lens are probably one of the biggest nuisances in scleral lens practices. And there's two types, and I'm not talking about small versus big, but there's the air bubbles that will be created when applying the lens to the eye, and there's the air bubbles that um, are caused by a lens that doesn't fit very well. So let's take a look at these uh, images first. Um, small air bubbles in the periphery, as you'll see on the left, typically are not a problem. But if they get bigger, then you'll see a dry spot in that area of the cornea, and you may actually see staining in that area as well. It's almost like you're not blinking in that particular little part of the uh, cornea. So, and apart from that, you may get visual disturbances as well, of course. And if you see an air bubble that doesn't want to go a bit way and is too big, you have to take the lens out and reapply it. The other one is caused by the corneal or scleral surface not being symmetrical and air bubbles simply creep underneath the scleral lens. If that is the case, we may have to go to a thorax scleral lens. And we'll talk much more about that in video number five. So that is what we want to look at. Is it an insertion bubble or is it a lens fit bubble? One other thing that uh, is quite annoying with scleral lenses is fogging. That means the vision will be uh, influenced and typically it is because of a debris behind the lens. So what we see in this particular image on the, is actually debris on the front surface. That's not what we're talking about. That is a wettability issue which we'll deal with in video number four. The fogging is a influx of maybe mucins, maybe lipids underneath the scleral lens. We think that there is not much tear film exchange in scleral lens wear as you have with a corneal GP lens, but because of the pumping effect on each blink, after each blink when the lens comes up again, you may get an influx of debris underneath the scleral lens, different small little particles. And you can see that actually in these OCT images, especially the ones on the right, for instance, uh, image number three, you, instead of a clearance, you can almost not uh, see the difference between the cornea and the clearance zone because it's full of particles. So with an OCT, you'll be actually be able to, uh, to pick that up. How to overcome this? Well, that's actually a pretty tough thing to, uh, to solve. It may have to do with the lens design. Some studies we did at the University of uh, Houston showed that um, good tears are important. So in dry eye patients, you may see a little bit more of that fogging. And you pr typically want to avoid any post tear layer thicknesses larger than 300 microns. In other words, the more clearance there is, um, the more fogging you'll get. Uh, at least the patient will pick it up much uh, easier. And tight-fitting uh, peripheral edges, um, they appear to increase uh, uh, wearing time. So it really has to do with the alignment of the lens on the, uh, on the ocular surface. Typically, the better the alignment is, and again, sometimes you may have to go toric, uh, the less fucking that typically is. If it is consistent, and sometimes it is not preventable, the patient would have to take the lens out maybe once a day, uh, refill it, put it back in, and the problem is solved. It's a nuisance, but for patients that 
see the benefits of scleral lenses and can actually see again, it's usually not a problem. As said, we don't think there's a lot of tear film exchange as such as we see with soft lenses and rigid lenses. What about other complications? Well, we did a literature research um, recently on this topic of scleral lenses and we tried to look at all the case reports and other publications and we tried to uh, split it up in non-adverse reaction and uh, adverse or severe reactions. And well, we've covered already hypoxia, the bubbles and the fogging. And one other one you, we probably want to mention is this one, it's the conjunctival flaps. That is where the conjunctiva, if there's loose conjunctiva, you may see it more in elderly patients, get sort of sucked underneath that scleral lens, as you'll see in this uh, picture right here. It's not always a problem, but sometimes the conjunctiva gets adhered to the cornea, and that definitely will lead to problems like neovascularization in that area. So you definitely want to try to avoid it. Again, it's one of these things where it's sometimes hard to overcome this. And again, aligning the lens with the sclera as much as possible seems to be helpful. It may again have to do with that influx or pressure from the periphery uh, out into the area underneath the uh, limbal area. And the amount of clearance in that limbal zone seems to be uh, one of the causes as well. So if there's more limbal clearance, um, this may happen. So you want to reduce that a little bit. Again, making sure that you still keep that clearance because that's the number one benefit of, uh, of scleral lenses. So that are typically the most non-severe complications. And then there's, of course, number one is microbial keratitis, a corneal infection. That's the one thing we worry about most. And in the next video, we'll be talking about hygiene. We'll be talking about disinfection of lenses a lot. So I won't get into that, but obviously, as in any lens wear, that is very important. In our literature search, we try to see what is the complication rate, what is the chances of a microbial keratitis. And it's really hard to determine. Because typically when we think about scleral lens wear, it's in challenging eye, it's in compromised eye. So if there is an infection, it's hard to determine was it caused by the underlying condition, whether it's a dry eye syndrome, a Stephen Johnson or a Sjogren, where the eye obviously is more prone to infection, or is it actually because of scleral lens wear? So that's very hard to determine. Our conclusion was the occurrence of adverse reactions in uncompromised eyes wearing scleral lenses has not been commonly reported in the peer review literature. In general, in talking to eye care practitioners again around the world that fit a lot of scleral lenses, they do not see a lot of problems. Actually, they see surprisingly little. We cannot put a number on it, and we don't actually quite understand why you may not see more infections because it's a stagnant tear film situation you have behind the lens. But maybe in theory, because the back of the lens does not touch or even come close to the corneal surface, any microorganisms like pseudomonas that live in the bio burden on that lens surface do not even get close to the cornea. So in theory, that could be one of the reasons why we don't see this um, in our scleral lens practices. So uh, this is the conclusion uh, for now. So in the end, what it comes down to is the risk versus the benefit ratio. And in scleral lenses, it's pretty obvious. The risks are fairly low and the benefits are huge, especially for some patients. Of course, when it comes to the normal eye, that balance may be a little bit different. So that covered the most important issues uh, that we see with, uh, with scleral lenses and how to manage that. So that concludes our third uh, educational video. And uh, thank you very much for watching. Brought to you by XL Specialty Contacts. My name is uh, A. Fennewarp. I'm from the Netherlands and uh, I want to talk you through the essence of uh, scleral lenses and uh, we're doing a series of five educational videos and this one is all about care and maintenance so this would be in our series number four.
And I walk, wanna walk you through a couple of items relating to the solution, cleaning, uh, the case, and wettability as well, as well as lens handling, the application and the removal of the lens. So the first thing I wanna talk to you about is the solution. And uh, actually the solution is very important as in crucial to the success of scleral lens wear. The thing is, the solution that's behind the lens will be there during the entire course of the wearing period. So whether it's eight hours a day or 12 or 16 hours, the solution will be there and the cornea will be exposed to that solution. So whatever chemical or whatever preservative there is in that solution that could be t potentially toxic to the cornea, probably will be. So and you want to avoid uh, an image like this where you will see corneal staining because of a solution toxicity. So typically, uh, the solution used in scleral lenses is saline, but ideally, although it's off-label, it should be an unpreserved saline solution. That's what used been used around the world to apply scleral lenses to the eye. Some even want to go as far as using an unbuffered one. Again, most of that was off-label, although there is a special solution now for scleral lens insertion, and uh, we'll probably see more solution coming on the market uh, pretty soon. So here you see a beautiful picture of a scleral lens on the eye with that fluid column behind it, and again, the exposure is there, it's entire cornea, and it's all day. The other thing you want to look at is if you want to evaluate the lens fit using fluorescein, as we've discussed in movie number two, um, you would have to add the solution first before uh, placing the lens on the eye, because it's really hard for fluorescein to get underneath. So just get your fluorescein strip, stir it literally in the bowl uh, until it's really green, you can't overdo it basically, and then apply the lens. And as for the solution, you want to fill the entire bowl. You actually want to top it off a little bit, almost like there's a little bit of a, of a curve. And then you want to apply the lens to the eye. Here you see a little uh, movie clip of a lens where the fluorescein was added later. And what we try to do here is to try to get fluorescein underneath. And we can manually, as you can see, but it's a, almost a little bit of a struggle. So it's that hard to get fluorescein underneath a scleral lens, although it depends a little bit on the lens design. For some it's more and other it's less. Um, but just as an illustration to show you that you wanna add the fluorescein first if you wanna evaluate the lens fit with fluorescein. What about the lens case? Well, um, one thing, I want to make very clear is that although we use saline solution to insert the lens, you cannot use that to store the lens overnight. So there's a disinfection uh, action needed. The lens needs to be cleaned and make sure, we want to make sure there's no microorganism growing on that lens the course of the day and then you're going to reapply that lens with those microorganisms. So we can either use a manual cleaner and then a conditioner solution for during the night. Remember, you don't want to insert the lens or apply the lens with that conditioning solution. You want to get rid of that because that could be potentially toxic. And the other option is using a peroxide system where you use a pretty toxic disinfectant and then you're going to neutralize that and there's various ways of doing that, just like any other soft lens, basically. The other difference may be the lens case although most lens cases would carry a scleral lens up to a diameter of maybe 16, 16 and a half millimeter. If your lens is bigger, you may want to go with a special lens case for scleral lenses that's available uh, commercially. Um, what I've heard people do as well is to get rid of the actual basket of the um, case of the, for the peroxide. Of course, leaving the neutralizing element in there, but then you can store the lens in that basket and get one for the right and the left. So that's another way potentially of doing it. Either way, make sure you disinfect the lens overnight and make sure the patient understand they cannot store the lenses in solution overnight. 
And also, not so much on the peroxide, but on the conditioning solution side, that lens case needs to be replaced regularly. You don't want any uh, bio burden to collect in that lens case. And again, microorganisms can grow in that. With that, it's also important to state that typically eye care practitioners in different parts of the world uh, agree that it's probably best to stay away from tap water with your scleral lenses as it is with, uh, with soft lenses. Tap water may contain some microorganisms, especially acanthamoeba is uh, sort of notorious for it. Um, so try to, away from, to stay away from tap water. So if you rinse the lens, uh, use some saline solution to rinse off any excess conditioner solution before applying the, um, the eye. And remember, typically these are compromised eyes, so they can be very sensitive. When it comes to the actual cleaning, uh, again, you can do that manually. Uh, breakage or warpage is not such a big issue with these lenses as they are typically very uh, thick, as we've discussed uh, earlier uh, in some of the movies. Um, again, you want to make sure it's, uh, the lens is clean, of course. Um, some companies will advise you to replace the lens on a yearly basis. The benefit of that, of course, is before you can get any scratches where potentially any mucin or lipids can adhere to, you're going to avoid that and you're going to start off with a, uh, with a new lens. Um, otherwise, there's special cleaning agent. Some cleaning agents, uh, they have a special A and B component to it, and therefore intense cleaning, maybe once a week or once a month. So some patients uh, need that to uh, clean their lenses. And that brings us to the next issue of wettability. You'll see a couple of images here where you can see the surface sort of fog up. Um, again, um, to, in, in order to avoid that, the cleaning process is important and maybe replace the lenses more regularly, especially if the lens surface is uh, scratched. And the other thing you can do is try to rub the lens before applying it in a conditioning solution. Again, that becomes a bit tricky, as we already discussed, because that may cause the toxic reaction. So what you want to do is you may want to rub it in a conditioning solution, rinse that off without really cleaning it, but just uh, rinsing it off, fill the bowl with saline, and then apply that to the eye. Some uh, companies and some eye care practitioners also advocate to clean the lens with maybe a Q-tip or even the, uh, the application, uh, applicator and almost like a windshield wiper clean the lens while the patient is, uh, is wearing it. That's maybe another way of doing it. Okay, so now let's take a look at lens handling. So we're talking about the application of the lens and the removal of the lens. And um, it's kind of hard to do it in a educational video, but I'll try to talk you through it. And also I want to share with you what different people do around the world. So some people would like the patient to stand up like this, Others would like them to sit down. Um, typically, the patient have to bend over in maybe a 45 degree angle or all the way like a 90 degree where the face is parallel to the, uh, to the ground because you want to insert the lens or apply the lens is a better term with that fluid. So obviously, if you want to do that standing up, the fluid is going to come out. And here's the tricky part, the fluid, especially with the fluorescein, a may stain clothing, so you want to have a towel there. You want to make sure it won't get on the uh, clothing of the uh, of the patient. And again, if you want to have the fluorescein evaluation, you need to add that first before applying the uh, the lens. Most people would like to have patient use the finger method, uh, like a tripod almost, at least, so they know how to do that. Uh, the other way of doing it is using a plunger. Uh, typically, it's a plunger that doesn't have suction, so you want to use it literally as a device to apply the lens to the eye, and the lens should not suck to that plunger when you want to let go of that. So here you see an example of how that is done uh, on an actual patient in a 45 degree angle. The first thing you want to do after the lens has been applied to the eye um, is look for that air bubble. If there's a large air bubble, like we see in this patient here in this 
uh, blue light situation with fluorescent that is going to be very uncomfortable so we'd have to take the lens out and reapply it again so in the beginning that takes a little bit of time to get that under the belt now on the lens removal again there's two ways of doing it one would be a manual system with uh, with the fingers and trying to get the eyelid underneath the edge of the lens and lifting it off most people would probably use a plunger and in this particular case it's actually a suction plunger what you would want to do is not to place it on the central portion of the lens but to use it uh, in the periphery under like a 45 degree angle try to lift the lens of lens edge off of the ocular surface to break the suction if you want and to get some air underneath and then the lens actually comes out pretty nice and clean. Um, one thing that a lot of doctors recommend is to apply a couple of eye drops to the ocular surface, just some fluid to sort of help that process of breaking the seal and getting the lens out. So as for the um, handling, there are special devices, especially for the application of the lens uh, to the eye, like a little stand, they're commercially available. Uh, some of them even have a light source, so the patient can look at that while they're trying to apply the, uh, the lens to the eye. Um, another option is sort of like a ring with a little uh, platform that you can use to apply the lens. And some even use like these little orthodontic rings that you can get. They're sterile, they're small, you put it on the, on the finger and you can put the scleral lens on the finger on that ring. The whole idea is not to have the lens tip over because it's a big lens with a lot of fluid in there. I think that pretty much sums it up on this uh, portion. So the to-do and to-not-to-dos on uh, care and maintenance is we typically do scleral lenses only for daily wear, unless there's a very special reason uh, not to, it's very severe condition, but we aim for daily wear. Uh, disinfection is required, so you do need a peroxide system or another manual abrasive cleaning system, and then the, uh, during the night you'll have the conditioning solution to make sure there's no microorganism growing on that lens. You want to avoid tap water and uh, maybe you replace the lenses regularly to avoid buildup of, of debris and uh, also to make sure that the lens wets well. And uh, when you apply the lens to the eye, use uh, neutral solutions because the exposure time of that solution to the cornea is uh, prolonged. Um, all right, well, in summary, I think out of the issues that I just mentioned, the solution is very important, but the handling is probably the really tricky part. And to get a handle on that, and obviously we can't do that in a video, is very important. One of the most frustrating things in scleral lenses could be that you fitted the patient, maybe you replace the lenses once or twice, have a beautiful lens fit, the vision is crisp, clear, and then they fail because they cannot handle the lens. And sometimes that just happens, which is very unfortunate. So getting a good training on the sclerosis is crucial in this whole process. What could be really helpful is to have an assistant specialize in that. So uh, the doctor doesn't have to uh, worry about that too much. He can focus on the lens fit and have somebody uh, do the handling and application uh, in a different fashion. So getting more comfortable with lenses, the cleaning and certainly the handling is, seems to be one of the crucial uh, portions of the scleral lens fitting approach. And with that, we've come to the end of this part of the uh, education video and uh, we want to thank you for uh, watching. Brought to you by XL Specialty Contacts. My name is A. Fennewarp. I'm an, uh, primarily an educator and a research in the specialty lens field, and uh, that includes scleral lenses. And uh, we're trying to talk you through the essence of scleral lens fitting. And in this series of five uh, educational videos, we're up to movie number five, which really talks about a little bit of advanced scleral lens fitting. So if you're familiar with the regular scleral lens fitting, this could be the video to go to. We're going to talk about back toric scleral lenses, front toric optics, 
multifocals even, a highly irregular scleros, what are we gonna do with those? Um, create larger diameter and more fold maybe, and how do we deal with conjunctival elevations? Let's go back to that fitting philosophy, the five-step fitting approach we talked about in movie number two. We went through step number one to four, and we sort of let it at step number five. Step number five comes in where we see that we have a truly uh, asymmetrical sclera. Actually, most scleras are asymmetric to some degree. Just in the last couple of years, we had the instruments to actually measure the scleral shape. We weren't able to do that. And at Pacific University, we've been uh, doing measurements on the sclera um, for a number of years now. And what we came up with, with something we call scleral topography. So you will have an image like this for a particular patient where you can see the different elevations and depressions on the scleral shape. The numbers we're using here are not diopters, as you would see on the cornea, they're angles, as we saw that the periphery, the sclera, and the limbus actually is more straight, tangential, than it is curved. So this is a summary of the result of a cohort of normal eyes, 100 eyes that we measured here. And what you can see is if you stay within 50 millimeters, the, we call that the limbal zone or limbal, or limbal angles, you see that the differences on average are not that great. It's when you go beyond 15 millimeters, the cornea, sorry, the sclera, starts to get more and more irregular. So especially on the nasal side, we'll see that nasal flattening, while the temporal, especially the temporal inferior and the temporal superior, would be typically the steepest. Why that is, we're not actually sure, but if you superimpose these pictures that we looked at earlier on the scleral uh, anatomy, and you see that insertion of the eye muscles, and you get that picture of the different shapes on the sclera, you'll see that most probably it has to do with how that eye muscle inserts. And on the nasal side, it's much closer to the limbus, so that is probably where we get some of that nasal flattening. The why isn't so important. What is important is that in clinical practice, if you add a scleral lens, if you apply a scleral lens to the eye, it typically does this. It decenters. It typically decenters inferiorly and then temporally a little bit. Now, the inferior decentration we could have sort of understand. It's gravity and it's certainly eyelid pressure and that whole tear film dynamics. Temporal one was harder to understand, but with that nasal flattening, we now we think we have an explanation for that. The lens moves in the direction of least resistance, and if the nasal is flatter, it will go temporal. What you typically see, therefore, in the clearance is that the clearance on the nasal side, remember in video number two we talked about that, is typically somewhat more limited than it is on the temporal which is not a problem as long as you keep that clearance also on the nasal side. And then you don't want it to be excessive on the temporal side. So it may become an issue. You have to start dealing with that. Centration is always better. And that's what I'll come to toric lens designs in just a little bit. To sum this up, if you stay within the 15 millimeters, in our studies we see that on average, the difference between one zone in one eye and another is roughly about 100 microns. You could get away with a spherical lens there, although in some eyes, as you see in this particular case, it can get up to six or 700 microns of difference, again, within that same eye. So that would mean you'd have to go to a toric or a quadrant-specific scleral lens, even if the diameter is no larger than 50. If you decide to go bigger, up to 20 millimeters, which sometimes we want to do because we want to create that extra clearance, for instance, the differences are getting, typically are getting bigger. We're looking on average on 400 microns within the eye, and it can get up to 1,000 microns in some patients. So we're talking twice the thickness of the cornea, so that most probably is clinically relevant. Actually, in all honesty, practices that do a lot with large diameter scleral lenses, they typically start with a toric lens by default. And then if the sclera happens to be symmetrical or spherical, 
they'll go back one step to a spherical one. But by default, they start fitting a toric lens. The beauty of that typically is that the lens centers very well, and you don't have that difference between the nasal and the temporal that we just talked about. The good thing is that no matter what happens on the cornea, whether it's a truly irregular cornea, an excessive cone, or a dry eye, or a scar, it doesn't matter. The sclera typically has the same shape. So in terms of lens fitting, apart from differences in vault, the scleral shape seems to be the same. At least a study at Pacific University by Roxanne Cohn showed that, or wanted to look at, is there a difference between carotid conus and normal eyes? And the answer was no, there wasn't. So in terms of lens fit and scleral symmetry or asymmetry, we're looking at the same kind of shape, which is very different than from corneal lens fitting. So is it bad if we want to use a toric lens? It's not bad at all. The lens centers very well, as I just said, and also the comfort typically can be better. Lenses are very stable on the eye, and if you want, you can even apply front optics to that lens without needing any additional stabilization. We would call that a peripheral toric or haptic toric scleral lens. So it has nothing to do with the optics of the lens. It's purely on shape. And again, if you have a lift-off, as we see on the uh, left-hand side picture, uh, if you want to bring that down, a toric or quadrant-specific lens would be your friend. Uh, if there's a lift-off, typically you get that air bubble thing we talked about in one of the earlier videos. A toric or other asymmetric lens would solve that most probably for you. One other thing I wanted to bring up in that regard is that conjunctival flap we talked about. Uh, sometimes that gets sucks under. Uh, it's a little bit of a nuisance and it's not always easy to overcome that. But one thing you could do is try to fit a toric lens or a lens that aligns more or better with the sclera so it won't get sucked under. Remember, typically that temporal inferior is the steepest part on the sclera. So if there is any space, then that is where that conjunctiva may come in. And this particular case is a good example because that is exactly what, uh, what happened there. Instruments like this uh, that can map the sclera have become available and we are using them at least in an experimental uh, research setting and hopefully they can help us to better map the sclera and design better scleral lenses and also upfront tell us whether that sclera is really irregular or not. Um, other, we talked about the um, impression techniques. There are impression techniques that can help us also align our scleral lens with the sclera if that sclera is truly extremely irregular as well. What about if the cornea is extremely irregular and you need extra height, especially the image on the right is extreme. Um, you may need a little bit of extra vault. Well, you can do that by going to a larger diameter and getting an extra fold. So typically, your standard lens um, fitting set would not uh, equip for that, but there are extra uh, lens designs or some companies have different uh, trial sets for you that can, um, that can help you in that. So here's another example with a very large diameter lens and excessive fold. So sometimes this is the extra mile you want to go. As you can see the picture on the right with the fluorescein, that is a large scleral lens. What about the optics of the scleral lens? Well, there's different optics options. Typically there are spherical lenses, sometimes aspherical. Optics may help to improve vision. That depends a li little bit on the lab you're working with. Um, what if the optics is not good enough? So you're doing an over-refraction and you see a residual astigmatism. It could be because there's lens decentration. Um, index of refraction differs between the lens, the cornea, and the fluid in between. So that is one of the reasons why sometimes you end up with some residual um, uh, astigmatism. You shouldn't worry about that at all during the fitting process. The most important thing is to get a lens that fits well, whether it's a spherical one, large diameter, small di uh, diameter, maybe toric, get the lens to fit well. 
then do an over fraction. If there is an over fraction, let's say it's a sill of one, if it's up to one and including one, sometimes going with a slightly thicker scleral lens could help. Remember, keep track of the oxygen, but that could help solve of that vision problem a little bit. Or you would have to go toric. If you happen to have a back toric or haptic toric lens that we just discussed, that lens is extremely stable on the eye. So you can simply apply a front toric optics to the scleral lens. If you don't have that, if you have a spherical lens, then the lens may rotate. And if that is the case, you may have to add a stabilization factor and different companies use different systems to stabilize that lens on the eye. In general, the lens may rotate in a certain direction and stay there, like maybe 45 degrees. And like you would have to do with any soft lens, you will have to compensate for that using the Lars rule. If it rotates left, you're going to add that to the axis. If it rotates to the right, you're going to subtract that. Again, just like you would do with any soft lens, it's no different than that. Typically, the lens is marked with a lasing marking or a little dot like that to show you where that flattest meridian is located. In addition to that, more popular recently have become multifocal lenses. People with irregular corneas, they get presbyopic too, and they may need a reading device at some point. So they have this beautiful device, and then they're not comfortable or not really happy with using reading glasses with that. So both center distance and center near designs are available. Uh, a lot of companies actually carry these now. The optics of these lenses are extremely good. They're way better than the soft lenses. And in a way, they're better than the rigid corneal lenses as well, as they don't move that much. So optic-wise, these lenses could work pretty well, at least for some patients, especially the lenses, the patient that already wearing scleral lenses. It could be a simple add-on. So one more thing that is certainly part of the uh, advanced course in scleral lens fitting is conjunctival elevations. So sometimes, and, and in the elderly patient even quite often, you'll see conjunctival elevations. So we're talking primarily about pinguacula, maybe, maybe pterygia, um, filtering glabs from, for glaucoma, but mostly pinguacula. And there's different approaches of what you can do to try to deal with it and manage with it. Um, they're a nonsense anyway. Lynette Johns described it beautifully recently in a case report series. Um, and there's different ways of doing it. One is to stay within the zone of where the actual elevation is. So trying to go to a smaller scleral lens could help if you can get away with that. The second approach would be to notch the lens. That means grinding a little space in the edge of the lens, uh, sort of literally bypassing that area of, uh, of elevation. It's a precise art of doing it, but it can be done. And the third thing would be to either get a really large diameter scleral lens, suppressing almost the elevation if possible, and or creating a micro fold. So that area, you could flatten the entire periphery of the lens, but then it would be 360, or you can elevate just one segment uh, right where that elevation is. Typically, you would have to mark the section you want to either have elevated or notched. So in, here's a beautiful example of that notching where the area is marked off simply with a marker, and you can send that to the lab, and they'll make that notch for you. So again, these are really advanced scleral lens uh, techniques, if you want. Uh, the basics we've covered in some of the other movies. Um, if you want to go back to that, they're available online. Thank you very much for watching. Brought to you by XL Specialty Contacts.